Welcome to Target Market Insights, a multifamily and marketing podcast. Each week, John Kasman interviews multifamily and marketing experts to teach you how to find the best places to invest, attract investors, and grow your portfolio. You are listening to Target Market Insights with your host, John Kasman. Welcome to Target Market Insights, the multifamily and marketing show. I'm your host, John Kasman, and I want to thank you for joining us for another great episode. Now, look, if you're enjoying the show, I need you to do me one quick favor. Just take a minute and leave us a five-star rating and review. And if you haven't already, make sure you hit the subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. Now, today we got a special guest, Mr. Scott Chopin. Scott Chopin is the founder of the Urban Pacific Group of Companies, a Long Beach, California-based real estate development company founded back in 2000. Now, they focus exclusively on urban infill and affordable housing communities throughout California and the Western U.S. Over the last 18 years, the company has developed nearly 1,700 units of unique-to-market urban housing communities throughout the Western United States. With that said, let's welcome to the show Scott Chopin. Hey, John. Great to meet you, man. Good to be here. Scott, great to meet you as well. I'm going to call my own self out there. I should have asked for clarity and 100% certainty. Am I pronouncing your last name right? Uh, it's pronounced Chopin. Chopin. Ah, all right. Well, I'll like, redo that and, later. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, like, you know, just like it sounds, right? <laughs> Chopin. Yeah, I want to be real fancy. Chopin. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Chopin. Got claim it. To it. Musical expertise. <laughs> There you go. There you go. So, Scott, hey, why don't you take a minute? I, I kind of went through your bio, but take a minute and maybe explain who you are in your words. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. So, you know, as the bio spoke about, we're, we're a real estate development company. Um, you know, I'm the founder of the company. I've uh, been in the real estate development business in, in various forms for, you know, almost the entirety of my you know, professional career, uh, have a family background in real estate development. My, my dad, Carrie, and my uncle Mike were uh, both in the real estate development business in, in different forms. So I grew up, you know, in a family of real estate developers. And in fact, for a time, it was, you know, the thing I didn't want to do. Um, but what it did end up uh, for me doing was when I was 18, I, I started, you know, as you get ready for your career, I start to think about, you know, hey, what the heck am I going to do? And uh, real estate wasn't necessarily my first choice, but I ended up reading one of those books that, you know, we've all seen, you know, how to make a million dollars in real estate investing on the weekends, right? Um, in fact, I think it's, you know, a fairly famous book. And what that did for me, John, was it sort of paired up the idea of entrepreneurship, of deal making with what I observed, you know, my uncle and my dad doing, right? Like for me, it didn't quite, you know, come together. And, at 18, I read that book and, you know, the light bulb went off and I was like, okay, now I see what I want to do, basically being an entrepreneur in real estate, uh, to be creative and innovative in that space. And basically from that day on, I, I sort of oriented my, my college, you know, career, my, my early professional career and ultimately my transition into forming our Pacific over the last now 20 years. Uh, into that. So we specialize in, in urban infill housing. Urban infill means we find sites that are vacant or underutilized in, in cities, to put it, you know, in a, in a, in a plain manner. Um, and we basically develop new construction uh, apartment projects in that domain. And then in the last couple of years, we've transitioned uh, exclusively into what we call workforce housing, um, which is a type of rental housing um, that pairs private capital with a moderate income, multi-generational family housing type. No, I love it. Scott, Scott uh, your story is one kind of that sounds like a second generation investor, right? Coming into it, didn't really want to do real estate. But as you educate yourself more, reading that book on the weekend, realize, hey, this is actually the path that makes the most yeah. sense for you. Um, you gave us a, a couple of phrases you said, urban infill, I really appreciate your explanation of what that means because it's a term that gets thrown around a lot. And uh, I think people assume that everyone knows what urban infill means, but just, you know, the way you explained, I think is very helpful. How do you come across the land for these urban infill opportunities? Is this something where, you know, it's just vacant land and you buy it or is it, you know, buying an existing property and demoing it or how exactly do you come across these urban infill opportunities? 
Yeah, great question. So, I mean, like any real estate developer, we have our, you know, the practices, the named actions we're in to find land. What I mean is, you know, we'll search the databases that I think everybody's familiar with, like a CoStar, uh, LoopNet. Um, we have brokers that we have relationships with that know our style of housing and the neighborhoods and, and you know, regions that we want to uh, be developing in. Um, but we also use other strategies. Um, you know, one that people might be surprised. I actually find Zillow to be an interesting source of land deals. Now, it's not a land deal platform. It's, you know, single family, as everybody knows. Um, but you can find, you know, apartment projects in there. Um, you can find small land assets. And I, you know, I like that because basically if you're looking to do mid-size projects, you know, mid-size land deals, a lot of times, you know, the brokers won't be so sophisticated to put it on a CoStar. Maybe they don't even have a CoStar account, although LoopNet's for free. Um, so I find just sort of an extra, you know, layer of deals inside of Zillow. Um, you know, you could use Redfin, I suppose, although we, we go to Zillow. And then we just look for any other strategy that is effective. So we'll call cities directly. Um, in California, we used to have uh, redevelopment agencies, which were city entities that uh, had subsidy and bought land to develop projects, although that's, those land assets are mostly gone. But sometimes cities know, you know, I'll call a city and say, hey, we're interested in coming to develop workforce housing in your city. Do you have any land that's available? Do you guys own any? Do you know of uh, something that's, you know, on the marketplace? And a lot of times the city planners have a you know, a little bit of feel for what's out there in the marketplace. Um, and, you know, just working our networks, you know, fundamentally, it's, you know, people that we know, um, that know, you know, I tell everybody, you know, all of our vendors are geotech, architects, civil engineers, you know, title people, hey, we're looking for deals, it's, you know, give them the parameters and tell them, you know, send it our way and, you know, we can help them with a finder's fee if they bring it to us. God, it makes a lot of sense there. So you're really working the angles of what's out there to find these urban infill opportunities. Uh, you started talking a little bit about workforce housing as well. Um, you know, I know when we start thinking about the opportunities in workforce housing, before we go deep, I want to make sure that we're all kind of playing from the same playbook here. Can you kind of just define what workforce housing is? Yeah, workforce, it's, it's a great question. Workforce housing has a lot of definitions. Um, I think in the mainstream conversation today, workforce housing is most often thought of an existing value-add apartment asset where an investor or sponsor will buy the asset, improve it like you would in a value-add, but hold the rents you know, similar to what they bought into to try to maintain the families that are uh, renting in that asset. And a lot of times those families would be working families, right? They're not, um, they make good, decent incomes, not enough necessarily to afford the new housing that would be in a marketplace, but they make too much to be in what I call true affordable housing, which would be government subsidized, you know, low-income housing tax credit type projects. So these folks exist in the middle between those two spaces between true affordable and, you know, like a brand new luxury housing. And so they're left with just certain choices of housing that's, you know, maybe not preferable or coherent with their lifestyle. And so for us, workforce housing means basically a new construction rental housing asset that's meant to be occupied by families that are live multi-generationally, meaning they have two or three related generations living together, right? And then more often than not, they'll be in the moderate income category, which would be often 80 to 120% of median income which, you know, every county across the United States has a different median income. So we would be coherent, uh, you know, for whatever the local county. So for us, it'd be Los Angeles or Orange County, as an example. And then we basically serve that marketplace with a new construction, uh, you know, rental housing offer, which really doesn't exist otherwise. Uh, no one's really doing this at scale. Got it. Makes a lot of sense there. So... As you look at the market today, right, we started talking about what exists and where the opportunity lies. As we're, as we're recording this right now, we're still kind of hunkered down in our respective homes during COVID-19. So as you look at the current landscape, how do you, I mean, how did you see it kind of 
I guess, for most of 2020? And how do you see it pivoting as you look forward and beyond for the rest of the year? Uh, when you say it pivoting, meaning workforce housing or the market generally? Workforce. Well, the, the let's say let's say the 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 real estate market, and obviously more specifically workforce housing. And how do you see that landscape kind of shifting as we go throughout the rest of the year? Sure. So you know, I'm like you. I'm doing tons of reading. I've been on more webinar, you know, market updates. Like you know, I'm more busy now with this stuff than I was when the market was at its peak. Uh, for all the same reasons that everybody is trying to find, you know, out most recent, you know, updated information. So I'll, I'll share a few uh, sort of anecdotal, you know, reads on the marketplace, but I'm listening to guys like, you know, CBRE, Capital Markets, Walker and Dunlop, um, you know, Robert Charles Lester, RCL Co., as they call themselves now, just looking for people that are expert in the space that don't have a, a particular agenda. You know, they're not an economist that wrote a book and, you know, is trying to sell books and scare people, whatever that happens these days. And so, you know, related to workforce housing, well, let's back up a little bit. So in the rental, let's talk about the rental markets generally. Rental markets will be impacted. I don't think there's any doubt in anybody's mind if you track any of the multifamily REITs, you know, they're fluctuating in valuations, but, you know, there's somewhere between 20 and 30% down in publicly traded REIT space, which you could argue is an indication of the market's assessment of the net asset value or NAV of those REITs, right? Which is the total value of their portfolios, right? Now, just because the net asset value goes down because the market, you know, is going down doesn't mean the underlying assets gone down in value. And this is, you know, one of the, you know, advantages of illiquid rental you know, assets is that, you know, they're not immediately impacted. But if we then move to the next step, which is what is the renter population? You know, how are they being affected by coronavirus with this lockdown? Obviously, the service economy, the service sector is being highly impacted. So your waiters and waitresses, you know, your delivery people, although arguably, you know, companies like Amazon are increasing that, you know, to some degree. So we see a general impact in the, you know, workforce, right? And in fact, in the people that we serve, these middle-income families. But here's the interesting thing about that. In my reading, it's anticipated that the major, you know, change in the rental market for that will be in studios and one-bedroom units. In other words, single occupant or maybe a couple, but single earner, you know, households, right? Um, that that will be more impacted, and then. One of the articles I read talked about the logic of people starting to move then into roommate situations or they're moving home with their families. And so uh, several people have argued, which we are a believer of this as well, is that units that are two, three bedrooms or more actually will be benefited for this because the, it's the opposite of new family formation. So in new housing, we look for new population growth, new job growth, and new formation of families. So, you know, um, you know, an adult child or, a, you know, moves out of the house and rents their own apartment. That would be counted as a new family formation, right? So now we're in the opposite of that, which is, you know, families now combining back together or people now getting into, you know, heavier roommate situations. And, and our you, our product type, Urban Townhouse or UTH, we actually build specifically in only a five-bedroom, four-bath townhouse rental unit with a two-car garage on the ground floor. It's exceptionally different, contrarian, but it serves this demographic combination of you know families, of roommates, into what we call the economic sharing model, right? So it's combining multiple wage earners in a household to then share incomes and expenses across a, a broader group of people to keep costs down, right? So utilities and rents share between multiple people is, is beneficial in economic trouble times or recession. So we knew this going into, like, you know, we started this program three, three and a half years ago. We always anticipated that this would be the case. And now that we're in it, although we're early, we're, you know, we can argue several weeks into it, we continue to see leasing volumes and leasing rates like the rents we're getting on these units actually are maintaining, right? Uh, we don't expect any acceleration in rents or volumes. In fact, maybe some deceleration in marketing in the lockdown. But sort of the assessment um, by economists and people in the real estate industry that 
families will now combine to share across a larger group economic sharing is actually coming to be true. And we're, this is like exactly where our UTH workforce housing model already existed. We just happen to be, you know, at the right place at the right time. Yeah, I mean, listen, when you think about it, it makes a ton of sense, right? You don't you don't have to be an economist to understand if someone loses their job or money gets tight, they only have a handful of options, right? I mean, if you're living by yourself, maybe you either get a roommate or you go back home for a little bit. Um, you know, you have a you have a few options that are that most people would take. So it does right. make sense that you would see a bit of a contraction of new family households, you know, and it's probably uh you probably see less ideally, right, I guess you would imagine more people will be trying to save money as much as they can. So they're probably not looking to expand their families, although that, that may or may not happen. Uh, right. But it makes sense fundamentally, right? I think at a at a high level, it makes sense that families would be contracting us instead of expanding. But you were not necessarily trying to time the market or yeah. doing anything like that. You just saw an opportunity to create a product with these UTH homes, these urban townhomes that could really allow people to live together, families to live together and kind of either save money through living under one roof, but really make it more streamlined with sharing of different bills. You know, one thing that we hear often is, you know, it is it is not profitable to build affordable housing. And I know that I'm saying affordable housing and there's some nuances and differences between affordable and workforce. Um, but two things. One, can you just talk about how that's profitable, your model, given the high construction costs that are out there right now? And then two, would you be able to just delineate the difference between uh, workforce housing and affordable housing? Sure. Let me let me answer the second question first. Um, so we call affordable housing, as most people call it, I call it true affordable housing, you know, in our you know internal conversations to just differentiate that. True affordable housing generally in the marketplace is, is government subsidized new construction or sometimes rehabilitated, you know, apartment units and usually has some sort of, you know, government subsidy and programs like the low income housing tax credit, section 42 light tech program combined together to facilitate the capital stack to, to develop a project, right? Usually all those programs have a, an income limit at or below 60% of median income. So remember before we, I talked about the 80 to 120 as being moderate, true affordable housing is 60 and below, um, has government subsidy, is developed under these very rigorous, you know, c- complex programs that, you know, require developers to compete for these subsidies. But what I say about that space is, it's the, the subsidy from the government is a finite source of capital. Okay. And so that means there will only ever be, uh, a, a, you know, a finite source of capital to develop projects. So there will always be a finite source of projects, right? And that the demand for those far outstrips the, the supply of it, right? So it's always going to be oversubscribed. You have many, many more tenants that need the housing than it actually is developed and then they can move into that, right? And so there's, you know, that that's the bucket of affordable housing. So for us, workforce housing, again, we talked about earlier is different definitions, but for us, workforce housing, the way we define it is pairing a moderate income housing offer, that 80 to 120 that we talked about before, with private capital. And that's really our, you know, if I were going to state our innovation in a really, you know, simple way, would be the pairing of this private capital with moderate income, multi-generational housing. Why that's important is because before I said, hey, subsidy is finite, right? There's only ever enough to develop so many projects. And, you know, we'd hope it rises as government, you know, uh, attributes more money to those programs, but it's always oversubscribed, right? Our innovation, UTH, basically has ostensibly the unlimited source of private capital. And I I qualify that because, you know, capital is never unlimited, but at least when that's feasible, and we can produce returns on it that, you know, we will be able to attract capital at some level. But there is no program that says, oh, you can only ever have this amount of money. And that's the, you know, that's the cap on it. And then we'll just fit whatever projects in we can. Now we say, hey, we can go to the capital markets like a market rate project, standard multifamily new construction, raise as much capital as we can feasibly and produce housing that's coherent now with the demand characteristics in that space. And then I'll finish with 
by the way, nobody's doing this. And, you know, we're not here to pat ourselves on the back on that. We actually, you know, our innovation is one, you know, flavor, if you will, and that space of multi-generational modern income families needs lots and lots of housing offers. So we're actually encouraging of the marketplace to develop further to have a basically a market-based solution to these moderate income families housing needs that's underserved presently. So one thing I did not hear you say in describing your model with workforce housing was any connection to government subsidies or any public funding. So right. is right. everything you're doing just with private capital? Yes. Well, yes with a qualification, right? So the the mainstream, the, you know, the main part of the offer is this pairing private capital with workforce housing, right? On occasion and happening, in fact, more regularly is that we may go to a city and they may say, hey, we would be interested if you could facilitate it, have 10% of your units be true affordable, say low or very low. And we would then, in some cases, develop an inclusionary component of our UTH project. It's still predominantly this private capital, you know, with moderate income structure, but we might carve out 10% of the units under an affordable housing agreement with subsidy to, in fact, then further lower the rents for those particular units. And we're actually open to that. And in California and in some other states, you actually will get like zoning benefits. So, you know, lower setbacks or a lower parking ratio when you supply housing that's, you know, affordable at these levels. And then, you know, in many cases, we'll ask for the subsidy. So we're actually very open to conversations with cities uh, about doing these inclusionary requirements. And in fact, we can facilitate projects more readily because the main driver of our project is the private capital with the moderate income and that we don't rely solely on the subsidy. Because in affordable housing, if you don't have subsidy to fulfill your subsidy gap or your soft financing gap, then your project doesn't work. You can't move forward to it until you resolve or fill that gap with the subsidy that you need for it. Our projects don't depend on that subsidy. In fact, you know, if you look at a pure UTH deal, it requires no subsidy. And in fact, it was designed that way uh, purposely. Yeah, I think it's really interesting because you you have developed a product that clearly has a need, um, but you're not necessarily, you, it hasn't been built where government subsidies are necessary. And the next question I have is, I'm trying to understand, and don't get me wrong, I understand that there is a uh, uh, a feel-good component to providing housing that people can actually afford and new development and things like that. But I want to make sure I understand from an investor's perspective, you know, where's the benefit? Why not take, why not just create higher end luxury townhomes as opposed to creating affordable, especially if you are trying to keep rents kind of capped at the same market levels? I'm not seeing where the benefit is for an investor. Yeah, great question. And it sort of alludes back to the question earlier is, you know, how do we make these deals work? So I'll sort of roll those two questions together. So you know, because of my background in both affordable housing and market rate housing, I, I had like the, the, the common background of those two worlds always being separate, right? Just like you alluded to, like, hey, look, if you lower your rents enough, you can't make a yield for your investors. And so that requires government subsidy, right? And then the other end of the spectrum is the classic, you know, statement, which is, you know, developers and market rate projects or just regular market projects have to maximize rents because, you know, that's the only way they'd be feasible given, you know, high land prices and high bill costs, right? And generally that's true, right? But because of the combination of things that we've combined in this UTH model, we're actually able to not only produce generally a market, you know, standard yield, but in many cases we've been able to exceed it, even beat the market, right? And we do that basically through several mechanisms that we've designed into the UTH model. And I'll, you know, there's no specific order to these, but I'll sort of just like give you the broad basket of what these things are, right? So a couple of things. So one is we build a specific unit type. And earlier I described that we, we build these as a townhouse. It's a three-story townhouse. And that's, and that's uh, important for this conversation because if you look at the market rate domain, predominantly, you're going to see, you know, middle and higher density podium projects. So think, you know, 
concrete parking structure below grade, you know, three or four or five levels of units stacked on top of that called the podium project for short. And that's, you know, your middle density. So think, you know, anywhere from 50 to 150 to the acre, depending on the unit size, right? And that's usually what people will build in an urban environment because land cost is high and they have to maximize the density on that piece of ground to make it work, right? Well, the trade for that is you have a much higher build cost, right, per square foot or per unit, depending on how you do the mathematics. You also have a higher rent figure, right? Because you have maybe smaller units, you're in the city, so you can charge more rents, right? Okay, so that's one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum would be your, you know, single family house that's super low density, and maybe you rent it, maybe it's like a single family rental, right? Very, very inexpensive to build because it's one or two stories, right? Except the, 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 the drag on that is that basically you can't charge enough on a per square foot or whole dollar basis to really maximize revenue. So you have a lower bill cost, but you have a lower rent generation capacity, right? So UTH is a three-story townhouse model with a slab on grade type five construction, which is your standard wood frame, you know, sort of old school balloon frame building. And in our both opinion and research and now proof from the model from the projects we've completed and sold, we are at the intersection of the lowest density lowest cost build, right? So it's a three-story model with a with the maximum capability to generate income as far as rental income in the on in the unit, right? And we need to maintain, you know, a coherence with this middle income model that we have because that's really our ethic. So three stories is at this intersection of maximum rent generation with lowest build cost, right? So we keep it very simple, right? We don't do podiums, right? We don't go underground. We don't do concrete structures or taller structures that require heavier duty structural components, right? We, we just really, at every level, we, we worked and we continue to work to remove complexity from the process of building it, right? So you can think of it like in the same terms of like a production home builder. Think of your KB Home or your Toll or Beezer or Lennar, right? And their home building model right at you know your starter home or your 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 sort of middle market home they're always going to be looking to simplify the design as much as possible so that when they build it they have maximum efficiency right and that's what we're doing so we keep the the complexity of the construction low plus we do the same unit over and over again we do the same footprint for this five bedroom four bath town home right so we got production and build efficiency okay so that's bucket number one Bucket number two is because of the demographic of the tenant base that we serve, which is predominantly working class, blue collar, you know, large families in urban environments, we're actually buying land in neighborhoods that's really not in consideration for your normal home builder or apartment developer. So think low income communities, maybe lower middle income communities, right? But these would be blue collar neighborhoods that predominantly have been passed over because the incomes weren't sufficient to build for sale or higher end luxury rental product, right? And so we can go into those marketplaces and capture land opportunities that are gonna be more cost effective, right? Because it's not competed for. So that's bucket number two. Bucket number three is right now, for the most part, we're only buying sites that are zoned for our projects without any other zoning process. So what we call buy right, right? Which means that we can go in and basically capture the land opportunity in some sort of an escrow structure um, and basically go immediately into CE or construction drawing production. And we eliminate that entitlement process or the you know zone change or general plan amendment, site plan review, whatever you have, you know, because these are California terms. And so we shorten the time period. So now we're more efficient in time, right? And then the last part of it really to me is the most important part is be the, the uniqueness of the size of our unit and the bedroom count really produces maximum whole dollar rents relative to the underwriting, right? While minimizing cost, right? So your least expensive build cost in a residential unit is going to be your bedrooms, you know, your hallways, your living rooms, mm-hmm. your non kitchen, non bathroom spaces, right? So think about it. We have five bedrooms, four bathrooms, and one kitchen. Now, we do have more bathrooms, right? So there is a cost there. Um, and that's actually sort of a, you know, a benefit for our tenants to have multiple bathrooms for large families, right? That goes. But in the context, we're doing 1,750-square-foot unit, right? One kitchen, 
And our kitchens are probably the same as you would have in a unit that's, you know, a thousand square feet or maybe even 1800 square feet. I mean, these are decent sized kitchens and we do pair them up with the family room. So you got a big space, kitchen, kitchen island, you know, larger family room. So we put those together on purpose to make it more livable. But our bill cost is very efficient and we are producing a lot of whole dollar rent. Our rents would average between three and 4,000 a month, depending on the market we're in, you know, micro market. And so we're able to generate a lot of whole dollar rent relative to the cost that it costs the building, right? In the apartment game, that's what you want to do. Generally, fundamentally, you want to maximize your rental revenue while keeping your costs low. So, I mean, that's true for for sale housing also. So don't only, you know, pass over that. But any one of those things, if you took it away, the model might not work or it might work, you know, less, meaning returns are lower. But when we start to combine all these things together, now the story is a coherent story for producing a project that serves this social impact, you know, modern income demographic, multi-gen, multi-generational, while also producing markets per yield. No, I appreciate you walking through kind of those advantages because I think it helps to illustrate why the model works without the subsidies, because I think that was the thing I was struggling with is, you know, everyone I've ever talked to, uh, when you start talking affordable and workforce, the first thing they talk about when it talks, when they get into the benefits are some of those subsidies, whether that is the opportunity zones, whether it's the, the light tech grants or, you know, different, different subsidies that are available, different grants, loans that are available to make the deal work. And you didn't bring up any of that. So I wanted to make sure I wasn't missing something. And I think the way you laid it out makes sense. The one thing that I will probably add is you obviously need to be in a market where building a five, four, town, a five bedroom, four bathroom townhome can't command premium rents like $3,000, $4,000. We're trying to do that in, you know, uh, some of these, the Midwest towns, I mean, you probably lose your shirt, but, you know, yeah. doing that in the West Coast definitely has, uh, has that appeal. Because again, to your point, you, you have markets where, um, it's very, you know, it's, it's unaffordable for, for many people. I was just reading something about, I think in the Bay Area, how, you know, the affordability issue is really starting to make uh, politicians reconsider how they they structure some of the laws and things like that, because it's just really becoming an issue for many of the residents who have been there for, for years, if not decades. That um, was so the genesis that. for the UTH program. I mean, this is a, like the way I describe it, John, is yeah. this a California story, right? Now you could make it more generic and say this is an urban story, right? urban coastal. Um, but, you know, we've written, underwritten, you know, obviously we're active in our home markets of LA and Orange counties, but we've underwritten deals in San Diego, the Bay Area, Portland, Seattle, Denver. And basically there's a need for this housing type and there's feasibility, right? Like we, you know, we found a piece of land, explored build costs, explored the rents that we could get, the operating expenses that we would need to pay to operate the, 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 uh, the apartment units. And so the story really is an urban story, right? Fundamentally, um, you could say urban coastal, like I said before. And, and you're right. As soon as you go outside of an urbanized market, so in, Cal in Southern California, we have a place called the Inland Empire, which is represented in San Bernardino. As soon as you go far enough away from, you know, the LA, Orange County metro area, you know, a few things happen. But one is land costs and bill costs start to drop, Right job uh you know the job centers you're farther away so people are you know willing to take less you know or, or make less even in the marketplace and so you'll start to see much cheaper real estate um you know you know you can you know rent a house for the same price that we would need to charge you know three thousand four thousand by the way sounds high uh, but relative in our you know active markets you know, compared to what you could find that's available in a five bedroom, four bath apartment unit. One, you don't have any of those apartments. They don't exist. Literally, we're the only guys doing it at scale. Um, and then usually it'd be your house, right? Your rental house that would be a competition for that. And a lot of the markets, you know, we're easily well above this three and 4,000 a month for a five bedroom, you know, for comparable house to what our unit um, serves. So, yeah, we're definitely a story of urban marketplace for sure. Um, but I think it's, we're finding as we explore new markets, it's more applicable, you know, broadly. So, you know, as an example, right before, you know, coronavirus hit, you know, we were doing deep research on the Dallas-Fort Worth marketplace. 
Uh, we think there's a story, some sort of a story in Texas. We're not fully resolved on that yet. Um, but, you know, bill costs, land costs are generally less expensive, much simpler to execute on deals. But then, you know, you can dr- drive 15 minutes from downtown Dallas and, you know, find a decent rental house for probably what we would need to charge. So I think there's, you know, we're looking for niches. I mean, we've always been, ex- you know, an exploiter of niches, you know, contrary and uncommon offer. Um, and so we may just, you know, try to find that in other markets. But what the reality is in our home market of California, there's so much demand given the limited supply that I don't ever see us like running out of opportunities of, of demand and marketplaces. And in fact, right now, even given this, you know, tumult we're in and economically, we're actually, we continue to see opportunities to continue the development story that we're in and in fact, even accelerate it both because we have these families that are now combining together more actively, but even before that, middle-income families were being pushed out of that marketplace and there was that demand characteristic. So now we're putting those two together and they're sort of the same story and overlap. But we see tremendous opportunity going forward and, you know, at least the next decade, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, you know, we'll be in a catch-up story in California, I mean, catching up supply to demand right? Given political constraint on development activities, um, I expect to spend the rest of my career, you know, running this company, uh, just doing this workforce housing. No, I appreciate that. And love the way you explain how the market really dictates where the opportunity is. And there's obviously plenty in California, but as you look at, you know, Seattle and uh, Dallas and some of these other markets and just kind of weighing whether or not there's an opportunity there, it makes a ton of sense the lens you're taking to look at it. You know, I want to ask a question from the investor's uh, point of view, right? So as I'm listening to you and thinking about the development side here, I'm interested to know how what you're doing with the UTH homes, how does that compare to say value add multifamily investments as well as new construction or new developments? Yeah. So like a comparison between those two domains? Well, from an investor standpoint, right? So, I mean, I I think most investors, they love to understand where, you know, what the risks are, but then also the profit, right? So what what are the profit potential and then what additional risk are there that maybe are not there in regards to uh, value add play or some new development plays? Absolutely. No, great question. So the way I like to approach this is I think of, you know, value add and new construction, you know, if you think about them, you know, in a residential apartment ownership and investment domain, I really think of them in three buckets, right? The first bucket is how do we underwrite apartments and make assessments of the marketplace for a deal, right? In a value add deal, you'll go in and, you know, find out the unit mix, you'll assess the market for rents. We do the same in new construction, right? The second bucket is the new construction zoning bucket, which is predominantly related to new deals, right? You know, in an existing asset, you don't worry about the zoning, right? It's an existing apartment asset. You don't have to care about the zoning. It exists, you know, and you you can move forward without worrying about that. And then the third bucket is the value bucket, right? Which is the same, again, for new construction and value add, which is what we care about as developers or investors in apartment assets is what value do we produce at the back end of a deal that is greater than what we bought it for. So in a value add, it would be the, you know, the, the sum of your purchase pl- price plus your, your upgrade costs and soft costs. And is your rent increase and your value increase enough to have it be profitable? Like you're in the money. And in new construction, in fact, I call new construction is just a more radical form of value add, right? We're taking a raw piece of land and building a brand new building, right? So that's the ultimate value add, but it still has the same metric. We have to produce more valuation and the value of the rented asset when it's completed and rented than what it costs us to build it, right? So I use those three buckets because I think, you know, it's a framework that investors that are familiar with bucket one and bucket two, right? So I'm sort of tying them together with the new construction. So it's really in the second bucket that the biggest differences are. And those are both the the place of advantage, right? And the place of risk. Okay, so a couple of things. One, when you build a new building, right? You have a brand new asset, right? You're not, even in a value add project, you would still have underlying structure. You have older systems, depending on what systems you want to upgrade, upgrade mechanical electrical plumbing, right? our building is always going to be brand new, right? So when you own and invest in that asset, 
you can look forward to a longer lifespan and newer, you know, technologies, better plumbing fixtures and some of that stuff you can upgrade. But, you know, we're on a full, whole scale, 100%. We're all new, right? So that's advantage number one. Advantage number two is we can design a product type that's unit mix, that's the size of the deal, that's the, you know, the program of the apartment project to meet the market as it is today. Whereas in a value add asset, you're always going to be buying what exists, right? And that's the advantage, right? I get to buy an existing asset, arguably cash flowing to some degree, depending on the occupancy rate. But if you buy, you know, a building that has all studios, well, guess what? Unless you combine units, you're always going to be producing, you know, rental offers in the marketplace for studio rents, right? And if the market is moving away from studios, right, maybe the market wants to have more two bedrooms, and I'm just making this up, you know, every market's different, you you don't have two bedrooms, right? So for us, at any point in time that we go into a new market, you know, let's say we go to Dallas, we go, hey, maybe it makes more sense to do a three-bedroom townhouse. We can serve a very specific part of the marketplace that's underserved, right? We'll do the research, we'll determine the opportunity, and then we look to make good assessments around that opportunity to make sure that we can mitigate the risk and that there's enough research to say, hey, this is a, you know, an appropriate idea. We still have to be cautious, right? We still have to be risk mitigating all the time, removing complexity, right? But we're always going to be having the, the newest, uh, most up-to-date program and unit mix uh, compared to any other right, asset. Um, so I think those to me would be the, 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 the two main um, advantages, right? Um, so some disadvantages. One, you, you have a raw piece of land or maybe an old house that you, you know, or old structures that you take down. So you have to build the entire building, right? And that's a risk, right? You have a heavier lift on construction, right? Um, where value add, you're buying an existing asset. I know lots of investors that I know that like value add because I go, hey, I get to go see the, the site. It's got some cash flow. It's not a you know a an empty piece of land that I have to create a new building on, right? Um, you know the other part of is lease up risk, right? Uh, on a new construction asset, you are leasing from zero occupancy, right? Where generally some value, most value add assets, I would you know argue people are anticipating that there's some underlying occupancy. Um, you can look at, you know, tr you know, trailing 12 and know, hey, this building was at, you know, 80% occupancy. And you know, although you'll adjust the rents upward and expect some, you know, re reduction occupancy rates, you're not zero, right? Um, the other thing is, uh, you know, uh, in, a, in a new construction asset, you are all money out, meaning equity and debt are going out to pay to build the asset for probably a period of between one and three years, right? That's the time to acquire the land, you know, get you through plan check, build the project and absorb it, right? And that's a, you know, that entire time, you're not generating any revenue. And that's unusual. In fact, that's usually the biggest comparison between value add and new construction that I find is highlighted for investors. They go, oh, so I got a two-year period where I have no income. And, you know, that is a, is a big difference. I think the key to think about just to end the, the point is it's really comes down to your sponsor, right? If your sponsor is a value add person thinking about moving to new construction, and you know, today's economic environment, I think that's probably going to lessen to some degree. Um, you know, you have to be making good assessments as an investor about who your sponsor is. And so you want somebody who's competent and expert in that space. And to me, even though I've been a developer and I continue to own assets that we've developed, I don't, consider myself to be a real estate investor per se. I am a real estate developer with all the special attributes that go with that. Like we create new projects from whole cloth and that's all we've ever done. I'm now like in my 35th year of my career, you know, for the totality of the time that I've been, you know, working in, in various forms in the industry and we've only ever done new construction. That's like our expertise and that's all we'll ever do. And I'm, you know, I'm like, I would say proud of that, but, you know, we've honed our expertise in that space. And so as an investor, you need to make good, clear, grounded assessments about who is the person bringing you this deal. And, you know, if they're value add and they, and they have always done that, that's their expertise. That's great. And in new construction, you should look for the same thing. And there are people that do both. Don't get me wrong. I mean, they're not, you know, rocket science, either of them. I just find that this, you know, it's a vastly different 
execution between the two and that zoning, new construction, new design standpoint to me is the biggest difference here between the two. Scott, great answer. Are you ready to move on to our bullseye round? Yeah. Give me a failure or an apparent failure that set you up for later success. Yeah, so one of the ones I talk about quite often internally and, you know, I share with people externally is, you know, going, you know, being a developer, you know, f- you know, I started this company in 2000. And so we had a good, about a six, six and a half year run before we ran into, you know, the, the teeth of the 2008 recession. And one of the things that really taught me, that really changed the way we did business and still shows up fundamentally is the way we execute on construction. And what I mean by that is when we're building these projects, we don't go out and hire a third party general contractor. What we have done since 2005, we brought all of our construction activities in house. So all of our superintendents and project managers, all the project coordination, the draws, the the contracting, the invoicing all happens in house with our own team, right? A team that we built to functionally manage these. And we did that because ultimately, when you have a general contractor, you shift, people argue that you shift the risk as a developer from yourself or your company as a developer over to the GC. And I I don't subscribe to that because ultimately, you are picking the GC and they're a third party and they're aligned for their own, you know, success, which may or may not be aligned with the developer, right? And ultimately, at the end of the day, if there's a breakdown and there's some problem to be resolved that's construction related, as the developer, particularly as a person, as the principal and the company giving a personal guarantee to the construction lender, I don't ever, I can't shift all or most of the risk to the GC. In fact, I sort of hand off the ability to control things to my detriment as the guarantor, right? So what I learned in 2005 is that we had uh, a ge- one general contractor that was managing two really major projects of ours and they basically fell apart, like, you know, on a, on a very broad, you know, uh, basis. And so we ended up basically going in and taking over the construction of those projects and it was very difficult, right? This was 2005, 2006 into parts of 2007 and we got the projects finished you know very thankful and you know grateful to our teams but we learned a lesson that ultimately no matter who the general contractor is as a developer you don't ever really shift the risk of guarantees and completion of the project to a third party you may hand off obligations and management capacity to that third party but you still own the risk right and so for me i always like to control the team that executes on the project now we have subcontractors right so we we don't we're not employing framers to go frame our buildings we employ subcontractors but we're handpicking the subcontractors we use the same subs over and over again we have the same design that we build time again we've simplified the plan we have the same specs like we're fully production oriented in this apartment domain right and that lessens complexity. Again, you'll hear this theme of reducing or eliminating complexity because what I say is complexity is the enemy of profits in the real estate development domain, right? So the more complex you have a project or the more complex you make the interrelation of people who execute on your team, basically you're going to erode profits at some level. And so not everyone will subscribe to bringing you know, construction in-house. Some people will say, I don't want to do that. And that's fine. I don't. I don't say it's wrong. It's just a different interpretation. But I know that we can directly control the performance of these subcontractors. That you know we're deeply you know coordinating with them, and we've been able to prove that model you know time and time again. Proven right now today by we still have some of the lowest execution costs and hard costs in the entire LA basin, right? As on a, on a cost per square foot basis. And in the like probably the most tumultuous time, you know, it's coronavirus time, we're actually accelerating our construction activities. Like we're actually moving faster now um, because we have more supply of labor and we can directly drop that to the bottom line. If I had a third party general contractor, they would try to capture that profitability and that speed of execution increasing because they're oriented around, you know, making their profit the most, not ours. Right, so we reduce complexity, we increase speed of execution, both of which drop more dollars to the bottom line. 
Give me the book you've gifted or recommended the most in the last year. Mm. Great question. So I, th- here's a book I always go to. Um, I really like Grant Cardone and I like his 10X rule. Now, I know, you know, with, for people out in, who will listen to this, very polarized. There's people that hate Grant Cardone. There are people that are rabid followers of it. I'm probably, you know, I, I'm not at all a hater. And, you know, I think some of the stuff that he does, I don't necessarily agree with his style. I mean, he stuff that comes from that sales background. But I really, there's a couple, uh, I'll just share this with you briefly. So in the domain of real estate development, you wouldn't think of marketing necessarily as, as a really effective strategy other than maybe marketing, you know, units to lease, right? But Grant Cardone, his book, The 10X Rule, has this idea of, of getting out of obscurity right of uh, basically being uh omnipresent where you're on a marketing basis you're getting yourself out into all the social media channels all the domains to benefit your business whatever that is right gary vaynerchuk basically says that all companies are now media companies right they have they they have to be uh producing in the media space in order to be competitive and for us where we're active is we're raising capital to produce our projects and so we're continuously growing our network of investors, right? And so we're building a full digital, you know, uh, marketing platform um, to produce many, many new opportunities. And so Grant Cardone, if you look at him and apply it to the space that we're in, and this idea of getting out of obscurity, that people need to know you to in order to transact with you. They need to know who you are in order to know that you have investments available. They have to know you, at least watch you over time to trust you, right? To say, hey, I've watched Scott Chop and Urban Civic for the last two years. I'm getting their weekly newsletter. I'm reading their blog posts. I'm looking at their YouTube channel and I'm watching them produce projects. So you are building trust constantly in that space. And really, you know, omnipresence, I never thought of that, John, until I read that book. And I was like, man, as soon as I read it, I go, I, I, you know, I'm doing that, <laughs> right? I was already doing it a little bit, but not, you know, not maximizing it. So I would encourage people to, to you know, to read that book and, and uh, get a copy of that book for yourself. Give me a digital or mobile resource you recommend for your business. Uh, do you mean third party or one that we provide? Just an app or something uh, that you like? Yeah. Um, good question. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna answer it in a couple of ways. So, one, I would encourage people to go to our website. It's www.urbanpacific.com, and we have a full investor education uh, area there that you know, video, articles, uh, blog posts, and we give a lot of background on you know, underwriting, assessing, investing, and understanding apartment projects. You know, we are a new construction developer we've talked about before. Uh, but we have an array of education materials. If somebody wants to go over to learn how to deeply underwrite apartment assets, you know, we, we offer that. Uh, I think for me, um, so, you know, I, you know, the one I like a lot, John, is Bigger Pockets. And, you know, I think everybody's familiar, most will be familiar with Bigger Pockets. And I've probably been less active there than I, than I was maybe, say, a year or two ago. Um, but I think it's an environment that's collaborative, right? You can go on there and find people that are like very in your specific domain. If you're wholesaling or you're house hacking or you're, you know, um, buying long-term bold assets, you're going to find somebody who is doing that that you can compare notes to. And I think that's really, you know, the, the underlying idea of that website plus others that are in the similar educational format really is encouraging people who are getting into the business to spend a lot of time educating themselves. Read every post you can about the, the type of product and type of deals you want to do. Read all the books you can, listen to all the podcasts. I mean, huge asset, you know, like your podcast for people out there in the domain. Um, you know, and so I would say Bigger Pockets would be a good digital format uh, for sure. Great place to learn. A very robust new construction section, by the way, which is where I spend a lot of time. Awesome. All right. And you're based on Long Beach. Give me the best place to grab a bite. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to give you, so there's a, there's a local uh, place called Joe Jost. J-O-S-T-S is the last, uh, the, the, the second name, Joe Jost. It's on Anaheim Street. Go to Joe Jost and get yourself a special. 
and a schooner of beer, which is this massive, you know, ice cold, you know, ice layer on the top beer, get yourself a special and get yourself a pickle bag. I mean, if you want to experience, you know, like classic, you know, old school Long Beach, uh, this is a place and you know, we'll go there and it'll be like no place I've ever been to. Joe Joe sounds like a great spot. Hey, listen, Scott, this has been uh, really informative. I appreciate you kind of walking us through what you've been working on with Urban Pacific and how you have been able to find a niche that really works well for not just you and your business, but solves a need that so many people have, especially out there on the West Coast with affordable housing uh, and workforce housing, I should say. So thank you again for coming on Target Market Insights and sharing so much of this knowledge. For our listeners who want to get in touch with you, what is the best way to reach out? Uh, best way, John, I appreciate that, is uh, go to our website, www.urbanpacific.com. Again, we talked about the investor education section. There's a contact page on there, uh, my email and my direct phone number on there. So I encourage people to reach out. Uh, I'm generally a resource, you know, in the real estate development space, generally happy to collaborate with folks. And, you know, everyone can feel free to reach out. Sounds good, Scott. You take care, man. It's good talking to you. We'll see you again soon. All right, John. Thanks so much.